Welcome, and thank you for joining today's IHBG ARP implementation training. Before we begin, please ensure you've opened the WebEx participant and chat panels using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. Please note that all audio connections are muted at this time. You are, however, welcome to submit written questions throughout today's presentation. To submit your question in writing, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided, and send. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. With that, I'll turn the call over to Heidi Frechette, Deputy Assistant Secretary for HUD's Office of Native American Programs. Please go ahead. Great. Thank you, Tegan. Kutso, everyone. This is Heidi Frechette. I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Native American Programs. It's an honor to be here today uh, addressing tribal leaders, tribal housing practitioners, and tribal advocates regarding the Indian Housing Block Grant American Rescue Plan Program, or IHBG ARP, as we refer it to. You know, we love acronyms in the federal government. So um, I just want to say, Wayne, well, and thank you so much for joining us today for this important training webinar. And I want to start out by saying I hope you all are staying safe and hopefully enjoying the weather that spring is bringing, warmer weather hopefully where you are. Um, and with the coming of spring, it's just re I'm reminded of the renewal that is taking place around the country with the help of the COVID-19 vaccines and all the efforts you all are doing in your communities. And as of this morning, over 40% of the U.S. population has received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine. And I know in much of Indian country, this number is even higher. So it's inspiring to see um, tribal communities continue to lead the way with the COVID-19 vaccine rollout and the response to the pandemic. And I really see hope and feel hope on the horizon with this latest round of COVID relief funding as well to provide much needed infusion of resources for Indian country to prevent, prepare for, and respond to the pandemic, both now and planning for the future. So we know that tribal housing authorities and advocates have been on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic and just very, very much appreciate and value your work and service to your communities and the strong partnership that we share in helping to address these needs. So as you know, on March 11th, President Biden signed the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 into law. And the American Rescue Plan provided a total of $750 million for Indian country um, to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19. And earlier this month, we published the IHBG ARP implementation notice which I'm sure you've all seen, but just in case, it's on our website at Code Talk. And so today our team will provide an overview of the IHBG ARP implementation notice, as well as waivers, and discuss the abbreviated Indian housing plans for the IHBG ARP funds. So we hope that you will um, access these funds as quickly as possible so that you can continue your great work in responding to the pandemic. You know, I know all of you probably know this, but we're just um, really inspired by the housing that's been developed, the improvements to existing housing, the assistance provided to residents through PPE, emergency housing for quarantine, and really all of the efforts that have gone into protecting our families, our American Indian families and Alaska Native families in the communities. So I really look forward to hearing about your projects and your plans for using the IHBG ARP funding and want to encourage you to continue implementing your CARES Act projects as well. And please, on all of this, there's a lot of resources coming at folks at once in a pandemic, and I just encourage you to reach out to us, to your area offices, to headquarters, um, if you have challenges or are facing delays due to the pandemic. And I want to remind you, too, that we also have technical assistance available. If you have ideas for projects that need some assistance with getting it started or you're facing new hurdles or challenges because of the pandemic. So please reach out to your regional training and technical assistance point of contact as well um, for more information or assistance on that. 
So I don't want to take up too much time. We have a lot of important things to get to. So I just want to say why I went and thank you again for your time and your investment today with us. And I'm going to turn it over to Hillary Atkin and the ONAP Grants Management Team, that strong team, both at headquarters and across the area offices to walk us through the IHBG ARP implementation notice, as well as address any questions you have. So, way in and stay safe, let us know how we can be helpful. And I'm just very thankful for our strong partnership as we work to lead the way in this pandemic response and recovery. Hillary? Thank you so much, Heidi, for that introduction. Um, as Heidi said, welcome um, to all of you, and thank you so much for your time and attention today. Um, we, uh, today we're going to be walking through the implementation notice for the IHBG uh, ARP funding. Um, and we hope that this is helpful to your understanding of how to get access to that funding. We want to make sure that there are a couple of main takeaways. We're going to kind of give those up front and then get into the slides. Uh, one thing we want to make sure uh, that you all take away from this is that the process, the requirements for the IHPG ARP funding are the same as IHPG CARES. Uh, so if some of what you're hearing today um, feels a little bit familiar, uh, there's a good reason for that. Um, also, want to make sure uh, that you all are aware that at this point, we are not able to issue grant agreements. Uh, we are waiting for the funding to be in the right uh, place, more or less, within our funding systems. So please bear with us as we uh, deal with the funding processes on our end. Please know that we're working to get that uh, funding through the processes as quickly as possible and that as soon as we are able to process grant agreements, um, for those of you who have submitted your abbreviated IHP and have that all squared away, um, we will let you know. Um, and then I think the other main takeaway today that we want to make sure you leave with is that although the process and requirements for this funding, for the IHPG ARP funding, are the same, they must be tracked separately and reported on separately. Um, so please keep that in mind um, for this presentation and moving forward. Okay. Now before, so we're going to get into the slides here. Um, here's a bit of a table of contents for you um, on what we're going to be discussing. Before we get further into the slides, I did, I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce um, some of my fellow presenters. So, I'm joined here today uh, by uh, members of our team here in headquarters that have been uh, working to implement the CARES Act funding, of course, and also the ARP funding. Uh, Gary Nemec is our Director of Grants Evaluation in headquarters, and he's joining us today to help with the presentation and with questions. We're also joined by Sean Duthie from our Alaska office, also a Director of Grants Evaluation. Um, to help with the presentation and questions. And then Rebecca Halloran, um, some of you may know her from her time in the Southwest office. She's actually recently joined headquarters and will be uh, working with us as a team lead and helping with the presentation uh, today. So thank you to all of you for your participation in, in those capacities. And I also want to say a huge thank you to Iris Friday who helped us put this all together. Okay, so we will be getting through a lot of content today, as you can see here on the slide. Hillary, we do have a poll if you'd like to do that. Oh, for sure. Does that pop up on the slides, or do we yeah, make it so, pop up? Yeah, so the poll um, is going to appear momentarily on the right-hand side of your screen. Just click on the answer you choose and select Submit once you've selected your answer. So click on the answer, and then click the Submit button. And you'll have a minute to answer this poll, and it has now been launched.
The poll question is, uh, what do you hope to learn from today's training? Uh, your choices are how to access the IHBG ARP funds, how to complete the abbreviated IHP eligible activities, or other. All right, you do have a few extra seconds to finish answering the poll, and then I'll go ahead and share the poll results. Okay, great. Well, you all should be able to see the results, I believe, on the screen. Looks like there's especially interest in eligible activities. Okay, great. Well, that is helpful, and we'll keep that in mind. Of course, if you have questions uh, at any point about what we're discussing, uh, eligible activities or otherwise, we'll be very help happy to take those, too, and we'll take breaks throughout the presentation to keep an eye on the chat and take questions over the phone. Okay, thank you. All right, so... Uh, briefly slide about the training purpose, uh, developing a practical understanding of the program, implementation notice, and the process that's outlined in that notice. Um, so I want to emphasize um, anything that you need to know about the implementation process for this funding is going to be in that uh, PAH notice, 2021-11. Uh, this time around, uh, with this ARP funding, the notice does also include uh, the waivers. Uh, you may recall the last time around that those were in a separate notice. They're actually all in one place this time around. So when I say uh, go to the notice, if you have a question, um, it's, it's even better this time. It's got all the answers. All right. All right, a bit of a slide on background. Heidi touched on most of this, uh, uh, but as you all likely know, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act was signed into law in March and provided uh, an, an additional $450 million in IHPG formula funding um, for uh, COVID relief purposes, and that is the funding that we will be uh, discussing today. Okay, so applying for the IHBG ARP grant. The IHBG ARP grants are, will be awarded as separate IHBG grants. So although the, the processing and requirements are the same as the CARES Act, uh, we are issuing the, this funding as separate grants. We do need to track the funding separately, and we do need to report on them separately. We have published the allocations for this program uh, to the ONAP Code Talk website. Um, the allocations are available there, and the notice, of course, uh, is also available on that website. More towards the end of the presentation, we'll do a little tour uh, of the website to make sure that you all know where those re resources are posted. Uh, we have, as with the CARES Act funding, we have streamlined the application process uh, while ensuring that the funds will be used for the purpose uh, that is provided under the Act, which is to prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19. To access the fund, um, the fund, you must submit an abbreviated IHP, uh, which is a streamlined fillable PDF version of the regular IHP. Uh, and we will walk through uh, filling out that form later on in the presentation. Okay, so a couple other pieces of information about the application process. Uh, the regular IHP form contains a total of 15 sections. Uh, in the abbreviated IHP for the ARP funds, you're only required to complete seven. Uh, and those are listed here. 
you will not uh, be using the EPIC uh, system, which you all are likely used to with the regular IHPG program. To submit this, it will be through a fillable PDF. Um, so you all know the fillable PDF is currently available on both the PIH Notices website and on the ONAP Code Talk website, uh, as well as some instructions on how to open that document in case you have any trouble. Uh, there, there was some trouble with opening that the last time around um, with IHBG CARES, um, so we did post those instructions again, um, and that will likely be helpful. The abbreviated IHP form must be submitted uh, electronically to your area ONAP, and um, the form itself does include specific instructions on how to use and complete the form. Uh, if you are with an Indian tribe or TDHE that did not submit an FY21 IHP, you could still take advantage of this funding opportunity, uh, just as was the case with the CARES Act funding. Uh, so you could submit your abbreviated IHP, and um, there's a couple pieces uh, at this, at, at right at the abbreviated IHP point in the process where some of the regulatory relief uh, that was provided under the CARES Act and again under their, the um, APR, or I'm sorry, the ARP uh, statute uh, is provided. So we will accept an abbreviated IHP that has not then or cannot be formally adopted by an Indian tribe or TDHE. Um, you've just got to make sure that when you are able to uh, get together and, and formally adopt the IHP, that that is done. Um, we can also rely on, um, or I, I should say another piece of relief that's uh, provided at this point in the process is that certifications that a tribe or TDHE would make with their IHP do not have to be provided up front, but those can be provided at a later time, or uh, ONAP can rely on certifications that were previously submitted for the regular IHPG program. So same, uh, same ability uh, as was the case with the CARES Act funding. Once the abbreviated IHP is submitted, HUD will review and make a determination on whether uh, it is in compliance with ARP and, of course, NAHASDA. If the uh, form fails to adequately describe how the proposed activities are tied to pre preventing, preparing for, and responding to, or I should say, or responding to COVID-19, or meet other abbreviated IHP requirements, HUD will reject that uh, IHP and notify the applicant of any deficiencies. Um, at that point, you would be expected to amend and resubmit, and we would work with you on any technical assistance needed to, uh, to get that abbreviated IHP in order. Following approval of the abbreviated IHP, you should expect your area ONAP to email you an award letter and grant agreement package of course, once we are able to issue those, uh, to sign in return via email. Uh, funds will be available to draw down from locks when the fully executed grant agreement is returned and processed. Documents uh, such as the grant agreement, uh, the grant addendum, uh, must be signed and sent back to ONAP electronically. Uh, so please keep in mind we're still uh, all teleworking and in and uh, receiving and sending out documentation electronically. And any documents with wet signatures uh, should be kept for your records. Okay, uh, so we just went through a bit of an overview of the submission process. Um, we're going to get into uh, some of the details that come along with that, including eligible purposes, eligible activities, I do want to take just a moment to see what questions we have and uh, take a shot at them. So do we have any questions in the chat or on the line? Yes, there are a number of questions from the chat. Um, let's see. 
Uh, if we that's receive secret. ERA, I'm sorry? Oh, nothing. I just said, sounds great. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> if we receive ERA money from Treasury, are we able to apply for this funding too? Okay, thank you for the question. Yes, for sure. Um, whether or not you received ERA funding from Treasury uh, does not impact your eligibility for this program. Great. Um, do we need to procure um, PPP or PPE items such as food uh, for distribution? Do we need, the question is, oh, I see. Do we need to do procurement on items such as purchases of PPE, food, or those sorts of things. Uh, yeah, so, so typical rules um, under 2 CFR 200, other requirements that apply to procurement under IHBG regulations, those same requirements apply here. There were no, uh, what I'm trying to say, there were no waivers provided uh, under the Act on that specific requirement. Okay, great. Um, there was a note that we need clarification on the FAFADA uh, reporting of contracts. Okay, well, we'd be happy to know uh, what clarification is needed. If there's any follow-up questions to that, we will get into reporting later. Uh, but generally, FAFADA reporting uh, is, is required for this program. Um, another is, is there a deadline for submitting the abbreviated IHP? Good question. No, there, there is no deadline for submitting, submitting excuse me, the abbreviated IHP. Uh, we do encourage you to apply uh, as soon as you can, of course. The nature of the funding is to address uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. It's, it's got a bit of an emergency funding feeling to it. So we just want to make sure that you all have the resources you need to address them. Okay, and uh, related, uh, if the tribe did not apply for any previous CARES Act funding, does this impact our application for the ARP funding, for ARP funding? Okay, good question. Uh, no, it, it's not uh, like an eligibility issue for this funding to, for whether let me back up. Whether or not you applied for the CARES Act funding does not affect your eligibility for the ARP funding. And last one, is there, or do tribes, slash TDHCs, have one year to expend all funds? There isn't a one-year limitation on this funding. Uh, I, I, there is a period of availability under the, the statute, of course, but it is not limited to one year. No. Great. And uh, there's been a, there have been a number of questions about the presentation and where the slides will be available. Those will be posted uh, on Code Talk. Uh, actually, at the, there's a link in the chat um, that Iris had put up where all of the information related to ARP can be found. Yes, great. Yep. And we will also, um, as I mentioned earlier, but you, not everybody may have caught, I will give a little bit of tour of Code Talk if we have time at the end to make sure we all know where the resources are located. Oh, okay, Apologies. great. Were there any questions on? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. One last one I overlooked. Um, uh, this Is this a reimbursable program? We can't draw down. I'm not sure what that question is getting at, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, this, this, this is Gary. Um, you will be able to draw down. All, all grant programs are reimbursable, but the same rules will apply here. You'll be able to draw down once the money is uh, allocated to the area offices and put in the locks. Um, you'll be able to draw it down. Oh, I see. Yeah, at, at this time, you definitely cannot draw down. We The funding is not in place. Um, but once it is, we will uh, be sending out grant agreements, and they will be available once the grant agreement is returned and processed. So hopefully that helps with that question. Thank you, Gary.
And I did see, I see a couple other questions are coming in. Uh, there's a question about whether you can already submit the IHP. Uh, you can submit the IHP for this program and get that process started. Uh, I would encourage you to do so. Um, I think that may also be getting at the issue with not being able to um, issue grant agreements at this time. That does not prohibit you from, of course, submitting the IHP and having that process. Uh, so I would encourage you to do so. Do you want to continue on? Were there any questions on the phone line? Um, if you'd like to ask a question verbally, you can dial pound two on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted, at which point please state your name and question. Again, that's pound two if you'd like to ask a verbal question. Thank All you, right, we do have a caller on the question queue. One second, let me unmute their line. Caller, your line is unmuted. Hi, this is Brad Locklear, Housing Director for Lumbee Tribe. Um, we just had a question about reimbursements. Um, it says non-federal funds. Um, you know, is, is it only eligible to reimburse NAHASDA funds, or if we uh, incur some costs, maybe through restri uh, unrestricted funds for housing activities, uh, would that be an eligible, necessary eligible activity under the ARP? Okay, thank you for that question. So maybe I see, and we're getting several other questions like this one that's related to some material that we're about to cover. So I think it probably makes sense for us to continue with the presentation. Uh, we'll address this question um, and then see if we cover some of the questions that are popping up here. Uh, so reimburse, reimbursement. Um, Grant funds for this program can be used to cover a reimbursed cost inc incurred by the recipient, but they have to be have have to have been to prevent, prepare, or respond to COVID-19. Of course, um, they also have to have been paid with non-federal funds. Um, there's uh, the similar um, timeline limitation uh, as under the CARES Act funding. Uh, it, it's just a bit different, uh, so I wanted to note that, too, that it's after January 1st, 2020. Um, with the CARES Act funding, it began on January 21st, 2020. Um, so I, I hopefully that helps with your question. Um, I think the thing to keep in mind, of course, that we said early on is that this is all working the same way as it did under the CARES Act. So if you were looking at reimbursements under the CARES Act and had to figure that all out uh, under the CARES Act, you would need to do the same approach, the same requirements around that uh, for ARP. So uh, part, of, is... part of what you want to keep in mind for that too, I think, is that um, including maintaining uh, normal, or I'm sorry, maintaining normal operations is also included as an eligible professor activity under this funding. So it may be that you're not able to reimburse costs that you incurred um, through federal funding uh, with this funding, but you can um, almost kind of make up for the fact that you had to use federal funding for a cost by using this funding to maintain normal operations. Um, so I hope that also helps. And Gary, please go ahead. Right, right. Um, so the caller asked about uh, unrestricted funds. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but just as an example, if if a tribe uses um, money that is not from a federal grant, um, it's it's money that the tribe has earned, and they use it for any of the allowable purposes to prevent, prepare, and respond. And they used it after January 21st, which means from January 22nd to the present. Um, that that can be reimbursed. What cannot be in reimbursed, for example, is if you spent Indian Housing Block Grant funding from your regular formula grant 
on, on items that are uh, to prevent, prepare for, respond to COVID, that, that funding cannot be reimbursed with this funding. But as Hillary said, instead of using that funding for maintaining your normal operations going forward while you're affected by COVID, um, you can use this grant funding for those normal activities, and that way you're saving IHBG funding uh, that you would have ordinarily used uh, for, for those activities. But it does definitely have to be non-federal funds. We can't reimburse one grant with another grant. Okay, great. Thank you, Gary. Okay. And, you know, I think the next thing that we would be getting into is eligible activities, uh, but maybe let's take a pause and see if any other questions came up on, on the purposes. Um, since, we're, since we're talking about it right now, might be able to look for any questions on that right now. Um, so let's just take a quick peek. So um, as a follow-up question, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. okay. as, a, as a follow up question, somebody asked, uh, w would that include costs paid from program income? Yes, it would. Uh, program income <coughs> is considered federal funds, I believe, in this case. Okay, great. That's, that's the one that I saw too. Thank you, Gary. Okay, and I don't think any, any of the rest of these deal with this. Subject, so let's move on um, and see if we answer some of these questions about eligible activities. Okay, uh, so in the notice, the uh, IHBG ARP notice, there are several uh, eligible activity examples uh, that I think will be helpful to take another look at. Um, so I know we're emphasizing that this is the same uh, requirement, same process as IHBG CARES, but you may find yourself uh, in a different um, set of circumstances this time around. It may be good to take a fresh look at the eligible activities, see what examples are given, um, and see how that applies to, to what uh, you are currently facing. Uh, so, as I said, in the notice, a whole bunch of different eligible activities that are in line with the waivers that were granted uh, in this area are given. Various eligible housing activities, uh, emergency response activities. Um, one thing we wanted to note as far as differences from CARES is that in this notice, we did list eligible activities pertaining to vaccination. So on the slide, you will see that we've uh, bolded uh, a couple different activities that have to do with vaccinations. Uh, we're, we're at a different place this, at this point in the pandemic. Uh, that's probably something that you all are working to address, uh, and this information may be helpful. Uh, continuing on to the examples from the notice, uh, there is a list of administrative activities. And we also have several um, kind of best practice or uh, activity examples from uh, various grantees uh, from our area offices that we uh, have included in the slides uh, to, to help you all think about what you can do with this funding. So a couple examples here from our last office rehabbing units for quarantine housing, uh, upgrading IT infrastructure for remote uh, activities, a um, couple others here listed, uh, temporary, temporary rental assistance, uh, those types of activities were, were uh, taken on in Alaska, food services, and rehab of privately owned homes for ventilation. From our Northwest office, um, also uh, some examples of IT um, improvements, um, construction of bathroom facilities, upgrading of housing office systems. Uh, there were, uh, on the next slide, an example of converting vacant, vacant units 
uh, for quarantine purposes and the purchase of manufactured home for quarantine purposes. And I'm sure there'll be some examples along these lines as we go through, but did want to mention um, lots and lots of construction uh, has been taking place to uh, address the immediate impacts of the of this pandemic and also the longer term uh, response. From the Southwest office, providing tenant-based rental assistance, rehabilitation of facilities and homes, and conversion of units to isolation units, purchase of modular units to alleviate overcrowded conditions, assistance, with tr assistance to tribal members with mortgages, and providing food delivery. From our Northern Plains office, uh, development of units for temporary quarantine, rehabilitation of existing units to reduce overcrowding, uh, infrastructure projects, uh, tenant-based rental assistance, all good examples of what can be done with this funding. Uh, from the Southern Plains office, providing internet services, emergency housing, constructing, oh, we have some specific uh, examples of grantees, uh, construction of six single family units uh, on the Chickasaw Foundation, and uh, construction of an office. From our Eastern Woodlands office, telework equipment, preparation of quarantine units, and payment of rent. Excellent cell phone towers, renovation of food distribution centers. Okay. Um, so as you can see, uh, a lot of examples of uh, possibilities here, uh, both within the notice, uh, you know, uh, Lots and lots of good uh, eligible activities, examples within the notice, uh, and some kind of real life examples here of what happened with the CARES Act funding that would also be possible um, this time around with the ARP funding. One thing to um, keep in mind, of course, with the CARES Act funding and again with the ARP funding is the concern of duplication of benefits. So as you're considering eligible purposes, eligible activities, putting together your abbreviated IHP and before expending uh, the IHPG ARP fund, uh, please make sure to conduct an analysis to make sure that there are no duplication of benefit issues. This includes insurance proceeds or other financial assistance that has been received or is available uh, to pay costs. Um, make sure that you retain the, any analysis that you do on duplication of benefits uh, for monitoring purposes down the road. Um, so we don't have, a, you know, a specific a process for analyzing that or a form for, for you all to fill out to analyze duplication of benefits, uh, but we do want to make sure uh, that you keep that concern in mind. There's a lot of money coming in and that um, you document what you've done. Um, and retain that documentation. Okay, so next we're going to start getting into the form and really going through how to fill that out. Before we do, I think we should take a break for uh, questions, take a look at the questions, and then I think we plan to take an actual uh, brief break um, before we dive into that next topic. So. Why don't we take a look at the questions? Sure. Um, these, are what related are? To, <laughs> these are related to eligible activities. Um, okay. What about funding of projects under construction that have delays of time extensions due to shutdown uh, or because of limited number of personnel? Um, I'm not sure if those are still eligible, and we do understand. Um, sorry. 
I'm not getting a clear question there. Um, okay, so I think the question or, or comment is maybe just wondering if we have concerns, if the, what you're planning to do uh, or planning to at least in part fund through ARP is experiencing delays. Um, so this funding, as someone asked about earlier, you know, timelines and whether there are limits, uh, one year limit on the funds. There is not a super near term limitation on the time frame for this funding. So if you are experiencing delays, um, and need to extend the time that you thought that you would you would uh, take for a project uh, that that should be okay. Um, of course, we want things to proceed because it's in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So you need to keep that in mind. You know, I know we've had some uh, grantees who have worked to amend their CARES funding um, to take on other activities other than what they had planned because of things like increased costs. Um, or delays. Um, some have considered whether, you know, maybe the timing is better now to pursue something else uh, and then maybe come back to previous plans if uh, costs go back down or if those types of issues um, start to clear up more or less. So definitely something to, to keep in mind, but please know that although we are doing this in response to a pandemic and we want to keep that in mind and we want to move this funding um, to address that, uh, there isn't a quick, you know, one-year timeline or, or something of that sort. Okay, great. Um, could this funding cover storage units related costs like a PPE um, related to the IHDG program under the existing IHDG grant? Okay, so the question is, could the funding be used for storage units? Uh, I think what you've got to keep in mind is the eligible purpose, right? So if you're preventing, preparing, responding to the pandemic and it otherwise fits within the eligible activities, you, sh you should be good to go. And I, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to um, use a storage unit for that purpose. Okay, great. Uh, is IDC eligible as part of planning and administration? Um, I, I don't think that's something that's specific to this grant. Uh, if you have some questions about how to kind of like split out um, indirect costs from administration, I would encourage you to talk that over with your area office. Uh, would the assistance for housing mortgages be for existing or new mortgages? I, I think, uh, you know, that's not part of the eligibility concern here. What we're looking at is eligible purposes, uh, and there's there's nothing necessarily requiring that it be a new or existing uh, mortgage. Okay. So um, is it preventing, preventing and responding and is otherwise eligible? Um, whether it's new or existing, I, I don't think it comes into play. I get it. Is the is the question whether or not um, a tribe can pay somebody's mortgage? Um, no, I don't think that was the question. No, I can't seem to locate the questions. Uh, I think it's just uh, would be if they're doing rental assistance or assistance for uh, mortgages, can they extend that to new mortgages or just ones existing? So I think. It, it, uh, I think okay. Hillary answered that. Yes, yeah. you can. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait, there's a clarification. No. Can they issue new mortgages to tribal members that need housing? Well, you're, you're issuing the mortgage. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Gary. I'm sorry. Um, at issuing a mortgage, um, meaning you're lending somebody some money, um, Yes, uh, if again, it falls within those purposes uh, okay. that Hillary pointed out. Um, mm -hmm. So there there are examples, like I just kind of went back a couple of slides there. Okay. We have examples of um, grantees who have done mortgage relief programs 
Um, so if the question is whether that can be done, we know that it can. We just got to make sure that it's it's meeting those eligible purposes and otherwise done within um, NAHASDA uh, requirements. Typically, uh, mortgage relief, though, is if somebody owes their house payment and can't make it because they um, they they are having to stay home and they do not have a job anymore. Um, that that you can provide under this program. Okay, great. Um, uh, the CARES Act was able to serve low, uh, non-low, and non-native. Is uh, ARP the same? Yes. Yes. And, and we're going to get yes. we're going to get to those uh, issues yes. later on. Okay, great. Uh, last one, we have a clarification on the indirect cost question. If you use these funds to pay staff salary, can you use these funds to pay the share of IDP that would typically be paid? Right. So, I mean, the question is not, um, I guess I wanna, what I'm trying to get at is the, the answer is not unique to this grant program. Whatever you are typically allowed to do um, under IHBG, you, you know, would be allowed to do. So I just encourage you to kind of sort through those details with your area office. Great, thank you. Uh, that's all we have for eligible activities right now. Okay, okay, great. So let me let me get back to where we were in the slides and make sure we are where I think we are. Yeah. So I think the next topic that we are going to get into is the abbreviated form, diving, diving into how to fill out the form and then um, diving into uh, where I think some of these questions are starting to go, which is the waivers uh, and that relief. So I think we'll take a, um, before we get into the form, I think we will take a 10 minute break um, everybody refresh your coffee, uh, go use the little girl or little boy's room, and we'll see you back here at three after the hour. Sound okay? Okay, we'll talk to you soon.
Well, hello, everybody. This is Hillary Atkin um, of ONAP back with the training on IHBG ARP. Um, I hope you were able to take a little break there. Uh, and what we're going to do now is just uh, get back into some questions. A few other questions came in while we were on the break. And then we'll pick it back up with going through uh, the abbreviated IHP form and how to fill that out. You want to clarify anything for the reimbursements or stick with the eligible activities? Yeah, so we, uh, while we were on the break, we were kind of wondering if we had gotten to one of the questions we saw about whether this is a reimbursable grant. So we talked about reimbursements. Generally, we talked about the issue with um, grant agreements not being able to be issued at this point uh, because the funds aren't in place. Uh, however, there was one aspect of it or one angle of it that we're not sure that we addressed. Um, so just in case this is helpful, uh, this once the funds are in place, if you have an expense and you know you have no funding available, you can get the get the bill for that expense and then draw down funds from this program uh, to pay for it. Basically, what we're getting at is you. You don't have to pay for a cost from your own pocket before you're able to uh, use these funds to pay for it. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. We did see a question or two. We weren't quite sure if it was getting at that, but we thought they might be and wanted uh, wanted to address that. Okay, right. So the question was the, okay. the question was um, these uh, the, the question that was asked. These are reimbursable funds. We can't draw down. And as Hillary said, um, if you have an obligation or a bill, uh, you can draw down. You don't have to pay it first to draw down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that covers all aspects of the kind of variety of questions that, that we've been getting. Um, but let's get back to, to the chat. So, um, sure. So um, Sure, before the next question, um, Al, there was an announcement that Alaska had a 4.9 earthquake during the break. Uh, took good oh, here wow. in Eagle River. Hope everybody's okay out there. And um, back to the eligibility question. Uh, can funds be used to hire a liaison between the TDAC and the local utility company to move housing projects forward? Hmm. I think that's a good question for us to to possibly follow up on. So if the person who's okay. asking if we could kind of like note that, um, you know, I think the yep. thing to keep in mind with all of this, uh, with all of the possible eligible activities are, of course, the eligible purposes. Um, but then when it comes to hiring staff specifically, you know, like how does that factor in with the administrative costs um, and those limitations? but we can certainly take a look at that. Okay. Um, can the funding uh, be used to improve aging water and sewer? Well, generally, yes, there is, there is the possibility of using this funding for water and sewer projects to prevent, repair, and respond to COVID-19. Okay. Great. Um, uh, this is a little long. Uh, we secured funding for new construction. Project was halted before construction began. Um, there is construction costs have been on the rise. Total cost for the project has increased. Can these dollars uh, be used to cover the shortfalls in the funding because construction costs increased? Project would provide new units. Um, uh, overcrowding was the was the purpose. Okay, so it sounds like uh, there are some unanticipated costs that have been happening with the project, and you're hoping to supplement the cost for that project with ARP funding. As long as what you're doing, you know, you were doing, you are doing with the project meets the eligible purposes and eligible activities for ARP funding, uh, that should not be a problem. It sounds like what you're describing, new construction to reduce overcrowding would be an eligible activity. Okay, great. Uh, can the funds be used for mess remediation? 
Well, just throwing it out there like that, I'm not sure. Um, this needs to be to prevent, prepare, and respond to COVID-19. Um, as described, that does not sound like it's necessarily uh, doing that, but I mean, there could be a version Are of that you, that is. Right? Like maybe you're right. needing Are, to make that housing safe for temporary right. housing or that right. kind of thing. Right, right. It's very difficult to answer these eligibility questions with broad strokes. So the, if, if you do have these type of questions, the best bet is to call your area office. We've got a process where um, when these eligible activities come up that aren't clear, we as a group take a look at them and then provide answers to the area offices or put uh, explanations in the frequently asked questions. Uh, last one, uh, can the funds be used to pay past mortgage payments if the TDHE is the lender for households affected by COVID? That's a good one. I think the um, one clarification point was whether or not they had, you know, previously um, waived them or held them, but. We, we, we'd have to look at more detail about that, I believe. Okay, let me put a follow up on that. All right. Yeah. Okay, so I think, you know, as the next portion of our presentation is to walk through the abbreviated IHP APR form. Um, Sean, Sean, are you still with us with this, with this uh, news about an earthquake? Well, since I'm in Montana, yes, ma'am. Oh, I forgot. Didn't still think. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> oh. well, you didn't feel the sure earth move? <laughs> so, Sean is going to take on this next part of uh, the presentation to walk through the form. Uh, just to reiterate here on this slide, a few things we've already discussed, and then we'll ask him to take it away. Um, to get the process started, to get access to the funding, you must submit the form, the abbreviated IHP uh, form, to your ONAP area office uh, electronically. Um, Sean's going to or to show you on the screen, but you must click a certain checkbox in order to make the form abbreviated. Last time around, it said IHBG CARES. This time around, it, says, uh, it, it also says IHP BG ARP. So please make so sure to Hillary, check that box. Hillary, in the question, somebody indicated that they looked at their abbreviated IHP APR form, and they said it looks just like the CARES form, and it should because they are the exact same form um, that you're going to need to fill out. But the only difference is in the box that you click to make it an abbreviated form that used to say IHBG CARES. Now it says IHBG CARES slash IHBG ARP. Right, but I will say if you happen, the one thing that may be helpful in case you're concerned that you're looking at the wrong form, um, and it's very hard to tell because they are essentially exactly the same. If you do happen to submit the form that was for IHBG CARES, we can still take it. Uh, so I guess I'm to, all that to say, don't stress yourself out too much uh, about making sure that the, the form you're using has the slash IHBG ARP um, words on it. Um, we can work with either one. Okay. Um, right, so uh, the abbreviated form has less information. It's a fillable PDF, as we touched on earlier. Um, and if you did not submit an FY21 IHP or the regular IHBG form, formula funding, um, you can submit the abbreviated, abbreviated IHP. Uh, we may need a little bit more information from you to proceed, but that is still possible, and you can work with your area on app on that. Okay, so we're going to just, I'm going to just stop blah, blah, blahing, and I'm going to let Sean 
take it away with taking us uh, through the form. Morning or afternoon, based on where you're at for everybody attending. I'm Sean Duffy. I'm the Grants Evaluation Director for the Alaska Office of Native American Programs, and I'll be walking you through the abbreviated form. One person I saw on the chat mentioned, why don't we just change the name of the form? It's mainly because the fact is the form is, the still, is still the same IHP APR form, but by clicking on that button, it removes those areas that you do not have to fill out as an abbreviated form. So thus, we did not rechange the entire form. It's just you get the benefit of not seeing all those additional sections that you would then have to know, I don't need to fill this out. Now, the form itself was created for the Adobe PDF Reader. The Adobe PDF Reader is a free downloadable reader that you can install on your computer, uh, a tablet that's an Android, uh, a MacBook, anything of that nature. So as long as you install the Adobe Free Reader, you can do that on any platform or tablet or device. You will want to use excuse me, the Adobe Reader, because of the fact that some other PDF viewers will not support all of the features of the program, such as the drop-down menus may not appear, the expansion of the areas as you're typing. Um, you'll see on the form, it might only appear like there's one line available for you to write a book yet. It will automatically expand. Some of the other PDF viewers may not do that. So if you're having a problem with it, first thing to do is confirm that you're using the free Adobe Reader to use it or an Adobe product. The second thing is, is to make sure, and these instructions are available on the Code Talk website for the grant, as, as well as the form can be downloaded from there. But what you're looking at is you want to be able to use that reader because there are certain areas here will automatically calculate areas. It will automatically copy forward. Those are some of the reasons why we suggest using that for a feature. If you're emailing it or when you download it, you want to install it either on your desktop or at least on your device. If it's a temporary file attached to an email or something, all of these features may not work because normally your personal security on your computers may block those things. So on the cover page, which is on the screen now, the two main areas that I want to bring up, because all the rest of the form is the standard IHP form that you would do each year for your grant, and that is, again, line three, where it is showing to select the IHBG CARES uh, or IHBG ARP grant. When you select that box, it will give you a message that says, are you sure? And you'll say yes. And once it does, it then it deletes or hides those areas of the form you do not need to fill out. The other area to take a look at, and that is line, a second here, 22, date starting prepared for COVID-19. Your expenditures must be after that date. That date also cannot be prior to January 21st of 2020. Next slide, please. Okay, since Hillary must be asleep, uh, we'll go to the next slide. This is section three. You'll jump from section one to section three in the abbreviated form. Section three is where the programs are. This is where you'll add in all the programs that you're wanting to do with these funds. Some of the areas to point out is under line 1.1, there's a unique identifier. A drop-down box offers you to be able to select whether or not this is a project for preventing, preparing, responding, or reimbursement. Again, remembering that reimbursement is for non-federal funds that if you're needing to reimburse, it has to have its own project in the IHP for that to be processed and approved. If you're doing an activity that may be multiples of these, you're doing one um, 
You're buying PPE, for example, for personal uh, health care type items that is approved through the waiver, you can select whichever one of those you feel is most accurate for it, even if you may be using it to prevent, prepare, and respond all three. We will not, we will accept your selection of why you are putting it on that area. So again, if you have something that's a combination type of item, it's select which one you feel is most appropriate and choose from there. In Section 3 on the program, the next one to bring up is line 1.13, eligible activity number. These are your eligible activities as per the regular IHBG program. There is one additional one. It is line number 26. It's titled Other COVID-19 Activities Authorized by Waivers or Alternate Requirements. Any of the activities that you're doing that would not be a standard program under your normal IHBG, this would be where you'd want to mark that. Again, purchasing a PPE or providing assistance to non-native uh, or non-low income. Those would be authorized under the waiver. When you select the eligible activity number, farther down on the form, on lines 1.9, there is an area called plan and actual outputs for the 12 month program year. When you've selected which, your, which of your eligible activities, it will automatically then choose which box you will need to fill out, whether or not this will be monitored by units, number of households, or planned acres if that applies. The next one to, that I want to point out is line 1.6, who will be assisted? Describe the types of households that will be assisted under the program. You have three boxes, low-income Indian households, non-low-income Indian households, and non-Indian households. One of those three must be selected. If this is, an, again, one of those projects that's a combination, you need to uh, if you have the data, you need to divide those out and create three, either, uh, either three separate programs. But either way, for whichever activity you do here, you need to check one of those three boxes and further explain in the uh, space that is below those three boxes who will be assisted and why. Again, we've already talked about line 1.9, the plan and actual outputs. Remembering this form is just like as if you were filling out your regular IHBG, IHB or APR. The yellow highlighted areas are usually those areas that are filled out for the IHP. The green areas, those are the areas that will be filled out for when you're doing the APR pro portion of this program at the end of your program year. At the bottom of this, Section, on pro, section three programs, there is a button that says remove and add. That's where you'd be able to use and continuously, you're not limited to only one project. This is where you would do your multiple projects. Moving on to the next section, you skip section four and go to section five on the budgets in the abbreviated form. Now some of the things on to help correctly fill this out, and on second as I'm trying to get this to go to the next screen. Uh, you need to the slide? No, I got it now, thanks. There are two tables in the next section of section five of budgeting. The first table is sources of funding. To we, we're fill out this that. form. John, I'm not sure we're seeing what you're seeing. Um, Are you seeing the sources of funding, the abbreviated ICAPR form? No. No. Let me let me scroll. Here we go. I think we're on the right one now. Sorry about that. Okay. Mine changed here, so that's why I was surprised. <laughs> the abbreviated source of funding. So now on this form, you'll notice at the top it shows. Uh, 
your first line of your IHPG CARES ARP funding. The first column, column A, is the estimated amount on hand at the beginning of the program year. That would be zero because you have not received any of your funds yet. It would not be money that has come over from the previous year. This report is only for your APR funds. Your, your second column, the estimated amount to be received during the program year, that would be the amount that you have been allocated. Again, in this column C, it shows a purple field. That will automatically calculate. Again, one of the features of the form. And then column D is the estimated funds to be expended during the 12 months program year. That would uh, be the total of all of your programs that you're going to perform during the year or estimate. And that is the second table, table two. So we can go to the second slide, please. And the, again, this is where the features of the Adobe Fillable Form help out because as you're adding your programs, on the far left where it has program name, those programs will then be automatically populated there. You will then estimate your what your expenditures are and then planning and administration. Remember that your total amount of what you're uh, projecting to spend cannot exceed the amount that you're being awarded. Okay, next slide, please. In Section 5, the budget area, there's also lines 3 and line 4 after the tables. Line 3 would be where you can put in any other information, narrative format, of explaining funding, uh, expenditures, any of those type of things that you feel need to have a further explanation. Line four would be is when you're doing the APR, again, if you have further explanation of towards expenditures, this would be a spot that you could put that into. It gives you an area for those kind of comments or clarification on anything that you feel that the area office should know as they're trying to approve your IHP. Next slide, please. As with your regular IHP, this section is your certification. It's the basic yes or no's or does not apply, and that is uh, such things as that you have programs in place to uh, perform these functions, um, whether or not that you have, uh, that you're certifying that you will follow the Title II of the Civil Rights Statutes, so on and so forth. This is, again, another section that would need to be filled out to have a complete IHP application. Next screen, please. This is the tribal certifications. Now, in this section, according to the guidance, and I'm going to go to that PIH notice, there's a section that explains that if the IHPG recipients are unable to uh, obtain these. They just need to have a statement by one of the authorized officials of the tribe or TV, TDAT indicating that it was not practical or safe for the tribe or TDAT to secure new certifications due to the impact of COVID-19. At a later date, this needs to be addressed, but at this point in time to submit it, as long as you have something on file from your FY 2021 IHBG grant or the FY 2020 IHBG grant for those in lieu of in case it's necessary, it can still be processed. But there is a statement that needs to be made when you're sending, submitting your application if your tribal certifications are not attached of why they are not attached and that it was una you were unable to get it due to the COVID-19. Next slide, please. Okay. 
one more certification, and that's your tribal wage rate certification. And again, these are all the certifications that are needed to uh, indicate that you have taken these into consideration. In this case, for the tribal wage rate, it's whether or not you'll be paying Davis-Bacon wages, tribally designated wages, or other means. And again, this would need to be completed for your IHP submission. Next slide, please. And let's go to the next one, please. Uh, okay. It looks like we're jumping uh, right into the to the waivers here, Sean. I think. Well, there should be one here for audits. That's why I was just surprised. So these have changed there slightly. There's wage wage certification, and let's go to the next one, please. Okay, and the next slide, please. Yeah, it looks like we're going right into the details on uh, on the waivers. Right. So, and Sean, we'll, so we may what? we may be missing a a, a slide with right. some information that Sean was expecting. What we can do is, uh, Sean, if you don't mind, kind of briefly describing it, and we can make sure it when we post the slides uh, to include what appears to be a missing slide. Not a problem. The last slide is uh, the audits. You will need to certify that uh, your entire federal funds, if you've received over $750,000 of uh, federal funds that you certify, you understand that you will need to do an audit uh, for the year of your federal funds. And that is just, again, another certification. That one would be with the APR portion when you're doing your end of the year report, that yes, you're certifying that you exceeded the 750,000 of federal funds, and that, yes, you do understand you'll need to perform an audit for the year's funds. Other than that, that is the form. If there's any questions concerning the actual processing or using of the form, please let me know. Sean, uh, this is Gary. I, I just want to emphasize when you're doing these IHPs and then in turn the APRs, that you do note what your intended out will be, um, whether or not you're building units or uh, providing services to families, uh, because that's an important aspect of the review or, or of the um, of, of what this money is being spent on, um, so that Congress knows um, how the money is being spent. Okay, great. Thank you, Gary. All right, so I think we'll get back. We'll take a bit here, get back to the chat, see if we have questions on uh, the form or maybe other questions that have come up since the last time we checked. And next we will get through some details on the waivers. But what, what are we looking like in the chat? All right, um, first we have, what is the grant performance period? Mm, okay, so I don't think I I believe that the performance period is not articulated in the notice. Um, the last time around for the CARES Act funding, we set a performance period of five years, and we will do the same here. Uh, it will be a, approximately five year length performance period, and that will be detailed in the addendum to your grant agreement. Okay, great. Um, what is the grant number? We don't have them yet. Uh, so as we were, have talked about a couple of times, we uh, don't have the funds in place quite yet through all that fund processing. Once we do, we will um, have grant numbers. Okay, great. Uh, must 100% of the IHBG CARES Act award funds uh, be expended or used before applying for or using the IHBG ARP funds? 
That's a good question. Uh, no, no. Your eligibility to apply for the IHBG ARP funds uh, is not tied to whether you have completely spent your CARES Act funding. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> similar, uh, does a TDAC need to submit an IHP for 100% of the allocation or just based on the current need? Oh, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, you, it is, the application is for uh, the complete amount of funding. So do your best to describe how you intend to use it. Uh, if down the road you need to amend your plans, given, you know, you had a current need and then later on your needs change, that is, of course, possible uh, to do an amendment. Okay. Um, let me add to that. So let me add to that one before you go further. On Section 5 in the budget, there's a column that says estimated amount to be received. That's where you'd put the entire amount of the grant that you're going to receive. Column D is estimated funds to be expended during the 12-month program year. So at that point, that's where you would only indicate how much you intend to spend during the first year. And then you could further explain that if you wish in line three in section five, stating that for the first year you intend to spend this and the balance in the remaining years or whatever. But you would apply for the entire amount in the beginning, so it would be awarded in the beginning. Thanks, Sean. Okay, um, there was an amount listed on the formula allocation PDF per tribe, so just so I'm clear, do uh, so you still need to apply for these funds? Okay, yeah. could you repeat the question? <laughs> sure, um, basically they're asking, you know, the allocation of, that's listed on the PDF, that's what is allocated per tribe, so they're asking, do we still need to apply? Uh, I think, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, the, well, right. the purpose of the implementation notice is to explain that you need to apply and how to apply, uh, which is through the abbreviated IHP. Okay. And um, these are repeats, but just to reiterate, uh, when is the deadline to apply? No specific there deadline. There is no deadline. Mm -hmm. um, and is there a limit on the grant funds to request? And the limit is that per those allocations on the PDF. Yeah. Uh, last one. Uh, I may have missed it, but when do you expect to have the funding in place? Uh, I, you know, I don't know that we have uh, exact date. Um, I'm hoping that we will have it in place next week. Um, but we don't entirely have control under, over that process. Maybe that's a good thing, maybe that's a bad thing. Um, but that's my best guess. Okay, uh, uh, as we're scrolling, do we need to provide physical signatures or can they be electronic? We, electronic signatures are acceptable, yes. Okay. Um, and total, de uh, total development costs, have they been increased due to inflation? Ah, we will cover a waiver on total development costs in just a bit. Uh, but there, okay. so for this, for the ARP funding, as was the case with CARES, um, you know, so we typically allow over 10% of TDC um, to be done without, appro without approval, without had approval for the, CARES funding and also here for ARP can be up to 20% over TDC. Oh, that should help with your question. The, the currently posted TDC amounts, you know, are on Code Talk. Um, they're 20, based on 2019 data, we are updating the TDCs with the latest data um, currently and should have those published soon. Okay, great. Probably um, all aspects of that question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, just a clarification, so uh, they asked you again about the deadline of the funds when they need to be expended by, so that it was uh, five years. Um, and then can uh, a TDAT use the IHBG funds with the ARP funds to cost share on construction? 
uh, can use yeah. IHPG funds as ARP to cost here. Yes, that this shouldn't be a yes. problem. Right, right, right. And there does seem to be a couple of questions about um, environmental release of funds. So mm -hmm. we are basically never allowed to waive environmental requirements for any funding, and that is the same here. Uh, so all typical environmental review um, requirements do apply um, to this program. Okay, well, that was my last uh, question here. You got it. Okay, great. Any questions on the phone line? Once again, if you'd like to ask your question verbally, you can dial pound two on your telephone keypad. You'll hear a notification when your line is unmuted, at which point you can state your name and question. Again, that's pound two if you wish to ask your question verbally. All right, looks like we do have a caller in the question queue. Caller, your line is unmuted. Hi, this is Mallory, and uh, I had to step out for like five minutes, but I'm not sure if you covered like environmental reviews for emergency shelters. Does that need to be done prior to development? Okay, well, thank you for the question. So generally all environmental review requirements apply uh, to this funding. There's been no kind of like special um, waivers through, through the, funding um, of those requirements. For emergency shelters, I mean, there are a couple of exceptions under environmental review that could apply for emergency types of situations, and I, I do encourage you to take a look at those to see if they apply to what you're specifically looking at. Um, but even if that's the case, right, you still have to document that you've considered that and that's considered an environmental review. Um, so I guess, you know, what I'm trying to convey is there's always an environmental review. Sometimes it's very brief, sometimes it's longer. Um, the in, environmental review provision regarding emergency type actions could apply to some of the things you're contemplating doing. Uh, please just take a look at that carefully. If you have any questions about your specific situation, I'd encourage you to, to be in touch with your area ONAP, and we do have an expert um, on staff and ONAP that can help them if they're unsure um, how to proceed. Thank you so much. No, oh, thank you. Anyone else That's on the all line? That I okay. Not at this okay, moment. Great. Okay, and, I, and it looks like no more in the chat, so why don't we uh, We do have another caller that just bit. happened to pop in the question queue. Okay, sure. Caller, your line is unmuted. Hi, I'm Cheryl Cloud. I'm the housing director at Westcliff Chippewa Housing Authority. I want, had a question about uh, potentially, we see a barrier in terms of housing applicants um, having bad debt from some time back. And it seems to be particularly applicable to the homeless population. So I was wondering if the bad debt, which would have dates that are beyond the January date, if there's any legitimate or eligible way to categorize any of that aspect under maintaining normal operations to remove that barrier. Mm. Meaning, I, I assume what you mean is to forgive the debt? Right. I mean, the idea would be to take some of these specialized funds and, like, you are authorizing funds be spent for rental assistance or homeowner assistance. Uh, this is another type of assistance, and, and somebody that's homeless has very few resources to try to alleviate that barrier. And in instances, you know, let's say they've got a, a bad debt from, you know, maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago when they were housed and it's still there and it's several thousand dollars. 
how are they ever going to pay that off to be eligible for the waiting list? I was just wondering if there's a mechanism in this pot of money to help to address that so they can get on the waiting list, get housing. And so, so the mechanisms are identical to those that you use under the regular formula program, IHBG formula program. Um, there are some emergency waiver provisions um, that, that arguably can be used for something like that. For example, if, if uh, somebody is behind in their mortgage and they're about ready to get evicted, I know there's a moratorium on that, but this is the only uh, example I've got uh, in my head, and they're about to get evicted, you can use this funding to, to help them bring them current in order to remain in the house uh, so that, that there's not overcrowding. You just need to be able to, um, you know, connect this to one of the three purposes, to prepare, prevent, um, and respond. Okay. Um, so, it, you know, again, it, it, it's, it's the double is in the details. It, it, it's hard to answer a question mm -hmm. like that without knowing a little more about it um, and, and, you know, kind of what's going on. So my suggestion would be you talk to your local office and then they'll mm -hmm. filter that question down to us um, okay. and we'll help come up with a, with an, a plan. Okay. I have one other question, and I'm assuming, so down payment assistance is an eligible uh, cost, is that correct? Again, yeah. it, it has to be connected to prepare, prevent, and respond, and if it is, it is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, anything that would typically be allowed under, maybe be, be a good point to point out that, you know, anything that's typically allowed under regular IHBG um, or eligible under regular IHB is eligible here, but there still needs to be that tie uh, to preventing, preparing, and responding. Right. And, and, and there's, a, right, there's a few other little strange things too as we go through, um, more of the uh, um, waivers. For example, I'm, I'm not sure that you can provide down payment assistance uh, to uh, a non-low income Indian family. Um, you know, that's more of a, a, of a temporary assistance. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, if, if, if the, the item is eligible under the Indian Housing Block Grant Program, it, it should, in all likelihood, be liable, uh, 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 allowable under this program. Yeah. Okay. So maybe this is a good segue for us to start to go through these waivers um, and see uh, if this helps with some of the questions that have come up um, and see what other questions come as a result. Um, so let's jump into that. Um, Okay, so some of these we have already touched on uh, in talking about the application process, and that would be this, this first one here up on the slide. Uh, if you're looking to look at those waivers in more detail, you could take a look at these slides. And of course, I always want you to um, kind of like as a first step, if you're, if you're considering something or looking for clarification on something like a waiver or the other requirements for uh, applying to these funds, um, make sure to always go to the notice. Um, there's a lot of good information in the notice itself, and that's what these slides uh, are reiterating. So, so a bit more detail on um, the waivers that were provided to allow for the abbreviated IHP review process um, that's detailed in the notice here. Okay. Uh, accepting abbreviated IHP that cannot be formally adopted at that time. We discussed that. Uh, tribes or TDHEs that did not submit an IHP in fiscal year 21. Uh, we did touch on that a bit also.
Okay, and also IHP certifications. We touched on if uh, a tribe or TDAG is uh, unable to secure new certifications due to COVID-19, we can accept certifications that were previously submitted. We'd be looking for statements to that effect um, in the, or along with the application. And later down the road, uh, consulting with uh, the tribe that is served in order to submit any uh, certifications, amendments, et cetera, once they're able to consult. Okay. So next step as far as, as waivers, which again are in the notice uh, itself this time around, and some verifications. So the waivers for the CARES Act, and again, for ARP, established that uh, alternative requirements can be established to allow recipients to deviate from their written, admission, sorry, their written admission and occupancy policies to verify income less frequently. The next waiver uh, in, uh, again, detailed directly in the implementation notice this time around for the ARP funding has to do with public health services. Um, same language as the last time around, allowing for these activities that wouldn't typically be allowed under the IHBG formula funding, but did want to point out that we um, also detail eligible uses related to vaccinations. So we touched on that as one of the differences earlier, uh, once again, um, highlighting that here as a bolded text uh, on the slide, and you can also find that in the notice. Okay. Okay, this waiver um, related to assistance to non-low income and non-native families, I think has come up a, a couple times, maybe not super directly in the questions that are being asked, uh, but this may be a good one for you all to take another look at. Um, uh, take a look at the notice uh, to better familiarize yourself with it. Uh, so the waiver establish alternative requirements um, that otherwise ineligible families be assisted in order to prevent the spread of COVID-19. So recipients can temporarily house any individuals, regardless of Indian status or income level, in tribally owned units or privately owned units. Uh, and just wanna emphasize temporarily. Um, other eligible activities that could be temporarily provided to any individuals include providing masks, now, medical testing kits, food preparation, and cleaning and decontamination. Getting back to what you said, Hillary, it, it, you know, these are just brief summaries of what these waivers are. Um, the, the notice uh, implementing this program controls. Uh, so this is, like Hillary said, a good starting place to look, but this, this waiver in particular uh, for assistance with non-low income and non-native families is, is a little longer and more extensive in the notice, and it's worth reading uh, to make sure that, you, you, you know, when, when the question comes out about, comes up about paying mortgages and, and things like that for non-natives. Um, it, it'll probably be able to answer that question for you. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, so specifically on the, on the mortgage question that came up, right? That's a good example yeah. of the details of the notice. Right. Um, there's a specific statement in, the, in this waiver, if you take a look at the notice, that permanent rental assistance, mortgage assistance, housing rehabilitation, and new, con new housing construction may not be provided for the benefit of these of such otherwise ineligible families under this waiver. So, so there is a waiver here to provide temporary assistance, but that um, the types of assistance possible are limited. Um, and when 
you know, the criteria of when the assistance that is available can be used is also limited, right? There's got to be uh, a specific, uh, let me see if I can find the language, it needs to be provided on a, in an urgent basis and could be temporary in nature. So there's definitely certain things that you're going to need to look at uh, in the notice to make sure uh, that you're falling within within the lines of that waiver, more or less, and you will need to make sure that you document that, um, depending on what you're trying to do under this waiver. Um, so it's the same as last time with CARES. There's a little, it opens up a little bit, or actually, I won't say that. Um, the previous waiver opened up a little bit as far as detailing, uh, you know, that vaccination assistance is possible. I think this one is actually exactly the same as last time. So if you're you were already familiar with it, don't worry. If not, um, or even just to refresh your memory, make sure that you take a look at this notice. Um, it's all right there for you uh, within the notice. What the limits are, what the possibilities are for assistance to non-low income and non-native families. Okay, another um, waiver on, that's uh, right in the notice this time around with ARP funds is on useful life. So this is actually, this might be a good one to take a look at, um, even for CARES funding. I think some, we've been getting some questions recently about um, how to deal with useful life now that the, the temporary need, or I should say the need to temporarily house someone in a unit that was built specifically um, to address COVID, for example, has gone. Uh, what do we do as far as useful life? Uh, that is addressed directly in this waiver. Um, once the purpose of, so for that specific example, once the purpose of using a unit for a quarantine um, has been uh, exhausted or once that use is done, uh, a grantee can decide whether they want to keep it on there. Um, as part of their stock, their housing stock, and at that point, useful life would apply um, or not. That's a good one, to, I think, to take a look at whether you're still working on CARES or um, whether you're looking at ARP. Similarly, total development cost waiver. Um, so this. Uh, you know, we definitely are hearing about the issues with rising costs, um, with everybody trying to do some really good work on constructing units and engaging in other activities to alleviate overcrowding in response to this pandemic. Uh, the waiver uh, that allows uh, exceeding PDCs by 20% continues with the ARP funding. Uh, so that may be another good one to take a look at both for this funding, um, but even for CARES, to remind yourself that that possibility exists um, with the issues that we're facing on construction costs. Okay, and then a question came up earlier. Um, I can't remember what it was, but it, it made me think of this and I wasn't sure if it was if it was getting at this, but a good thing to keep in mind with the ARP funding, which was also true with CARES, is that we are prohibiting the investment of any IHPG funding provided under the ARP Act. Uh, so I think there was maybe a question that, um, that got at, can we draw down the funds immediately? And I wasn't sure what, what the question was getting at, but if it was getting at for purposes of investing, uh, the answer is no, you cannot. You cannot invest the IHPG ARP fund. Okay, uh, another waiver uh, provided under CARES and again under ARP and in the AR IHB ARP uh, implementation notice, HUD is excluding IHPG ARP funds from counting towards the uh, Indian tribes undispersed IHPG funds from prior years under the undisbursed funds factor. Um, this would be for the next formula funding. OK. 
Okay, a couple other uh, points to be made under um, waivers and alternative requirements. Uh, as we've touched on, the relief provided by the waivers and alternative requirements will apply retroactively to the date that the tribe or TBHE began <clears throat> preparing for COVID-19 uh, as early as after January 21st. So that's a confusing way of putting it for ARP, it's January 22nd and on that we could go back to um, for reimbursements of non-federal funds and for applying uh, the relief provided by the waivers. Okay. All right, so before we get into reporting requirements, let's take a look at the questions and see what has come up. Okay. Um, this is partly related to waivers and still some application ones. Since the POP, since the POP and the grant numbers are not established officially yet, should we hold off on submitting our uh, IHP APR for IHP for ARP until those are determined, and how will we know? That's a good question. I, I would encourage you to not hold off on submitting your abbreviated IHP um, for two reasons. One is, of course, once we have the funding in place, you would then be able to more quickly receive the funding to address um, the impacts of the pandemic. Um, you know, it's kind of an emergency feeling to this funding, so it would make sense um, to want to get a hold of that as quickly as possible. Um, and I think along the same lines, I don't think that um, not having the POP would, should stop you from that either. I, I think we touched on earlier that for the CARES Act funding, we established a POP that ended up being about five years. We're planning to do the same here. Um, so I, you know, given that this is emergency type feeling funding, I don't think that's, uh, you know, knowing whether it'll be five or five and a half, you know, the slight difference that that could, that could occur um, should hold you back from um, submitting that abbreviated IHP. But the, the long and the short of it, I guess, is it's plenty of time, I would think, to address um, impacts from the pandemic. Um, so it shouldn't stop you from submitting the IHP. Okay, great. Uh, are model activities allowed? Well, you'd have to put in for it. <laughs> so maybe, I guess, is the answer to that question. <laughs> you know, I think, I think you'd want to first take a look carefully to see if what you're trying to do, um, but, you know, assume if you're asking about model activities, it wouldn't typically be allowed under IHBG. Um, but you might want to look carefully to see if it's already addressed in the waivers um, as a potential different from normal IHBG uh, eligible activity. And, and, and you've got to limit. A... I'm sorry, I was just going to say, I don't think, you know, in our notice that we mo we limit the ability to request a model activity. So I wanted to say that right. and, Sorry, Gary. I, I, you always have to keep in mind that it has to be uh, to prevent, uh, prepare, prevent, and respond to. Um, right, right. Right, so that's such a point, you know. Keep in mind, not only do you have to satisfy typical model activity um, requirements, you, you would need to look at that too. Yep, great, thank you. All right. Again, that's something you that's something you can talk to your local office about and and uh they can help you and, and they can work with us to figure out um how to help you. Uh can you use funds as upfront costs for a low income housing tax credit project? Hmm. I guess the question would be, is the low income housing tax credit to prepare for, mm -hmm. respond to, or prevent? Um, 
and uh, it, 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 it's possible that you can. I know you can use them for shared costs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems that under that general umbrella of uh, reducing overcrowding, which would be a prevention. Right. Um, but right. Um, last one, and this is a little, uh, so uh, under the eligible activities, uh, can you provide for a little bit or more explanation on acquiring, specifically um, acquiring, like for mobile units during the quarantine, how would they be used afterwards? I well, that, I think, it. yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of up to you. That's, 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 so I think this is getting a little bit at the useful life thing. I yeah. would encourage you to look carefully at that um, at that information in the notice, but I, I think the feeling is it's kind of up to you. You could incorporate those units into your housing stock, and at that point would need to attach a useful life and those types of restrictions um, or not. Okay, um, one last one. Um, can a TDAC purchase land with these funds? It, it, it again has to fill. It has to fit within those three purposes. Um, so the yes, there's a the, that you can do that. Again, the devil's in the detail. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that is that's it for now. Okay. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, do we have any questions on the line? I'm not showing any questions on the phone at this time, but once again, if you'd like to ask a question verbally, dial pound two on your telephone keypad. Again, that's pound two if you wish to ask your question verbally. It looks like we do have a caller in the queue now. Caller, your line is unmuted. Hi, um, my name is Janie, and I'm um, calling from Nevada. I was looking as we're, we've been going over the presentation, I've been um, kind of hovering over the um, the IHP, and on the top under the grant number, when you hover over it, it comes up with that 20BZ, um, and which is in the program descriptions and that um, the one that was issued with CARES. Um, is that not the grant number we use along with our adjoining number? Mm -hmm. Good question. Uh, no, it is not. Okay, so um, don't do use the 20. Okay. Yeah, that's the number from CARES. Okay, um, all right. For, that... for uh, ARP, it will be a 21. Okay. Um, and we don't have the, the next code quite yet. So okay. thank you for that question. You know, once we, once we get the code, we may update some of those specific instructions that are in the form itself. You know, we're aware that it's an issue and are kind of like, from you know, more or less keeping an eye on it to see if it how much confusion it causes. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, my next that's question is, no, that I, was just, fun. I was just wondering, um, the slides that you were going over, where do I find a copy of those um, so I can go back? Because they're a little bit different than what the CARES one was, um, and I can't find them on yeah. Code Talk under, under the, this program. Yeah, yeah. So good question. We uh, we will be posting the slides after the training. Oh, As you okay. Can imagine Great. we do like we do like little tweaks right up until the moment we present. <laughs> so okay. <laughs> we we will post uh, after this training. But you can you know there are a few differences of course that we've discussed um, to like vaccination eligible activities. Mm -hmm. uh, but you can for the most part rely on the CARES Act training slides if you are looking to maybe clarify a few things uh, for your IHP while you're waiting for us to post, so like, you know, we could post it by tomorrow, but if there's something that you wanted to take another look at today, you could look at those slides or even the notice uh, to get a little bit more clarification. Okay, one, thank you. One thing, that I can, one thing that I can point out along with your observation that they are slightly different, um, the programs are very similar. The, the one thing that this program doesn't have that CARES had, 
CARES allowed you to reprogram your 2020 IHBG formula grant and to use it um, under the waivers. This program or ARP does not permit that. So you can't reprogram your 2021 funds and, and use them under the waivers. Uh, the waivers are only applicable um, to your, your ARP funding. Okay, thank you. That's Hillary, this is Sean, one more, thing, one more thing I'd like to point out. This was just, yeah. I just noticed that under line 22 in the heading, first page of the form, it states IHBG CARES amount. That should be IHBG ARP amount that you are being allocated. So I will talk to somebody and have that changed on the form, but don't let that stop. You just know, understand that on line 22 of the first page, section one, we are not asking you what was your CARES amount that you were awarded. That should be the ARP amount you're being awarded. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Janie, for your questions. Uh, Any other yeah. callers on the line? Um, no, not at this time. The other person, uh, look, nope, they just came back into the queue. One moment, please. Caller, your line is unmuted. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is Brenda Acklecock with Bristol Bay Housing Authority in Alaska. Um, Sean was earlier talking about identifying who you were providing the services to. Um, if we were to use a portion of the money, um, we have a, a food bank in the region that has a lot of donations and government commodities. All of our villages are rural and remote with no roads. If we were to use um, ARP money to do procurement for airline vendors to freight the government commodities to the villages so they will have food, um, most of the villages, if there is a non-native in the household, um, it, it's usually not a non-native only household in our villages, so would we, um, be correct to select the Alaska Native and American Indian for the description of the service population? Mm. That's a good I, question. I so you basically ask, oh, go ahead, Jerry. Go ahead. Right, right. So, so this question also came up under CARES because, for example, if you're handing out face masks or, um, you know, uh, wipes and stuff like that, and you're purchasing a large quantity of them to hand out, um, it, it's going to be hard to tell who you're handing it out to. So, yes, I think the answer to your question is yes. If, if, if what you're doing is eligible, if it is eligible, and it meets those three uh, requirements or one of those three requirements to prepare, prevent, or respond, um, you can just generalize and assume that because you're in rural Alaska, uh, a vast majority of those individuals that are receiving the benefit of what you're doing are Native American or, and, and probably uh, low income. Um, so the, the answer to your question is yes. You can just say Alaska Native American Indian. Okay, I, I had a follow-up. Um, I was hoping by us doing the procurement for the air freight um, to ship the food and not providing any funding to the food bank that we would, doing it this way would mean that we would not have to treat the food bank as a sub-recipient? Right. That's a little more complicated. Um, why don't you talk to your area office? Um, 
that's a good question. I, I, mean, you're, I you're, and, and, you're, and they said yeah. they would have to contact Washington D.C. Right, but it, what what it, what that what happens there is a bunch of us sort of get together and scratch our head and look at each other and um, and try to figure it out. Um, but but are are you procuring them directly, or are you giving money to the food bank to procure, or? Yeah. We would not give any money to the food bank. We would do procurement for freight and put the government commodity food and donations on the plane to get shipped to the villages and then report on the number of pounds of food sent to this rural remote village. Right, right. Um, I, 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 I think since you're procuring, you're not really creating a, a, a sub-grant relationship. You're creating a relationship of procurement, you're, you're a contractor and contractee. Um, so to the, it, it, I'm assuming that this is probably eligible. Um, so no, the sub-recipient, uh, uh, you don't have a sub-recipient here because you're procuring a service that is benefiting you. It doesn't matter that somebody else is providing a service that is compatible with it. Um, I, I don't see a subrecipient agreement, but there is a contractor contractee um, relationship that may, and we're gonna to get to this a little bit, that may be reportable under FAFADA, under the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act. Um, but but I don't think the subrecipient uh, provisions would apply. Okay, thank you. This is very helpful. If you if you had given the money to the food bank, donated mm -hmm. it, or provided it to the food bank, and then they contracted, then you would have a subrecipient agreement. But since it's direct, um, I don't believe you do. Okay, thank you very much. You bet. Thank you for the question, very good question. All right, I'm not showing any other questions on the queue at this time. Okay, great. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat either, so why don't we move to the next uh, portion of the presentation which is everyone's favorite topic, reporting. Do you, do you want me to handle this part, Hillary? Sure, if you'd like. <laughs> well, no, I, w I wouldn't like, but it, there seemed like there was a, a pregnant pause there, and I felt the need to say something, so I will. So. Um, the reporting here is um, very similar to the reporting um, that you're doing under the CARES Act. The difference is there's, there's not going to be, well, at this point, there's not going to be quarterly reporting through some form of a portal that has yet to be um, constructed for the CARES Act. Um, but anyway, so you'll be required to provide a quarterly financial, a federal financial report, SF-425, uh, on a quarterly basis, and they, um, and they are due 30 days after the end of each quarter, including the program year's last quarter. Uh, so that's how this program and the CARES program differs from your typical formula IHBG program. In the typical formula IHBG program, the uh, fourth quarter um, SF-425 is, is due, I think, 90 days at the same time the APR is due. Um, You'll, uh, as part of the abbreviated IHP, you'll also have 
the abbreviated annual performance report. Uh, that'll be due um, as, uh, as you typically file your APR for your uh, IHBG program. Um, but something that you should keep in mind, again, we, we, are, we are trying to report on these uh, different uh, sources of funding separately. So you'll be filing um, an APR for your a a a IHBG formula program, for your IHBG CARES program, and for your IHBG um, a ARP program. Uh, so you, you, depending on whether or not you've received or, or sought funding for you, uh, these two programs, you could be submitting three per year. Um, and and in, in that abbreviated annual performance report, you'll be providing um, information about the expenditure of grant funding uh, by activity. Um, and this is, like I said, it's separate from your IHBG formula APR. And it recover and it covers your typical reporting period, uh, and it's due to your ONAP just like your typical report, 90 days at the end, uh, after the end of your program year, unless otherwise specified. Um, the, uh, the ARP program is relatively new. Uh, we're still uh, discussing reporting requirements with OMB. Um, and within the agency, um, so there may be some additional reporting requirements, but unlike CARES, if you recall, under CARES, if you were a recipient of $150,000 or more, um, you would have to provide quarterly reports once the portal is established, there's uh, eventually going to be, and hopefully it's going to be available for the July report, a portal in which you would report quarterly your expenditures per eligible activity or per activity that you're conducting under the CARES Act. Um, that was established because Congress under the CARES Act specifically asked for quarterly reports. Um, under the ARP, Congress did not do that. Uh, so we're going to rely at this point on just the APRs uh, to provide that uh, low level or that uh, more detailed level of expenditures. Next, next slide. Um, so in the abbreviated APR, again, just like uh, in the CARES, you'll, uh, you'll report the amount of funding you received. You'll report what you expended it on, uh, what, what the particular um, purposes were, prevent, prepare, respond. And then there's, uh, as you know, there's, uh, as Sean pointed out, there's also reimbursement. Um, that is one of those, reimbursement will fall under one of those three. Um, and then you'll provide a list of all your activities, uh, a description of the activity, including whether the activity is eligible under the IHBG program or is eligible under one of the waivers. Next, next slide. Um, you'll provide a list of all activities, uh, an explanation how the activity uh, addresses one or more eligible purposes, like I said. Uh, an evaluation of the completion status of the activity, an estimated number of eligible families, non-eligible families uh, that you provided uh, services to, and the name of a contact person um, in case there are questions. Again, this is 
identical to what you'll be providing uh, under the CARES APR. Next slide. Oh. So there was, uh, before we get to the general resources, there was a question about the applicability of FAFADA um, to this program. FAFADA, you might recall from some earlier training on reporting, is the Federal Funding Accountability and Transparency Act. Um, and that is an act that it has application to all federal agencies and all grant programs, whether it's the CARE program, a a ARP, or your typical uh, Indian Housing Block Grant program, the formula program, um, you are required to report um, on contracts and subrecipient agreements that I believe the threshold is that are over $30,000. Uh, there's not a lot of information that you have to put in there, um, but it, it is something that's required across the government. HUD has not been uh, very strong in the enforcement of, of FAFADA, um, but I think that that is, is changing. We're going to rely on that um, uh, to, to, to provide a portion of the information that we're reporting on this act and the CARES Act, and, and it's just simply a requirement. Um, there'll be probably some additional training on reporting if there are any changes, but I would suggest that you take a look uh, at um, Code Talk. At uh, there is there was a training that was conducted. I want to say November, and I could be wrong. Um, that was uh, recorded, and there is a. Uh, um, a, a, a set of slides that talk about reporting under FAFADA that is something that you might want to take a look at. So that's it, Hillary, if you want to check on questions or. Okay, great. Thank you, Gary. Um, so let's see if there's any questions here before we, what I'm going to do next is take us on a little tour of ONAP's Code Talk website. Um, so why don't we take a look at the questions before we jump into that? All right. Um, this is a question related to reporting. Um, for the 425, is the project or grant period based on what's identified on the grant award, or is it on a fiscal year basis? I'm sorry, I don't quite understand that question. Um, can, can, can you read it to me again one more time? I'm sure, sorry. Sure. To properly report on the 425, is the grant slash prod or the project slash grant period based on what's identified in the grant award, or is it on a fiscal year basis? It's on a so, fiscal year I basis. Okay, great. Um, these are not really related to reporting. Do you want to take them or sure. circle back? Yeah, for sure. You take a couple more questions and then we'll then we'll move along. Okay. Uh, if the subrecipient was previously funded with IHBG and they completed their useful life, um, can they be assisted again? with uh, ARP funds to renovate their units? The, the, so you're the wondering. Sub-recipient, the subrecipient completed their useful life or? That's the question. The, the housing, I guess, the that the subrecipient built. Right. Has, has completed their use for can can they be assisted again with our funds to renovate the unit? Um, my my view is yes, probably depending again on you know the like I keep saying the 
the devil's in the details. Um, but if, if the renovation is being done um, in order to prepare, prevent, and respond, um, and the renovation is for a, a, a typically eligible uh, recipient, um, yes. Mm -hmm. If the renovation is is for prepare, prevent, respond um, for a non-native or, or non-low income, the answer is probably no. Um, as, as Hillary pointed out, it, you need to take a look at that waiver on providing services, temporary services to non-eligible um, recipients uh, to see whether or not this would fit in. Okay. So again, we don't know yeah. enough Thank about you. this to know the answer. All right, great, great. I mean, a lot of the stuff is like what, what you're proposing could possibly work, right? Right. to make sure to check the details. Yep. Right. What, what we don't want to do is try to give you or, or to tell you, um, you know, the, I mean, we want to tell you the answer to your question, but the best way to, to deal with these issues is to put it in an IHP or to call before you put it in an IHP, your local office, um, so we can get more of the detail. They can help you put it in the IHP uh, in order to uh, address um, the requirements of, of ARP. Um, and, and then they can get more detail as to exactly what's happening here and, and can provide much better guidance. I, I, what, I'm, what I'm afraid of is people relying on us saying, yes, that sounds like it's eligible, and then, you know, you're going to go to your area office where you're going to add the details, and they're going to say it's not eligible. Um, right. So well, they'll fix, all of our, they'll fix all of yeah. our screw-ups, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank goodness they're around. Thank goodness. Um, okay, uh, if a tribe did not apply for IHBZ CARES and will now apply for um, uh, the ARP funding, ARP funding, can the tribe apply for both the ARP and the CARES Act, uh, applying for two separate allocations? That's a good question. Yes, yeah, so you can still apply for CARES Act funds if you did not originally. One thing we were kind of keeping our eye on um, with uh, some of the, um, what am I trying to, stuff coming out of Congress basically since the CARES Act funding was whether that uh, ability would be cut off or or that funding would be moved to a different program, left, any leftover funding. Um, that has not happened uh, and the ability to apply for CARES funding still exists. So if you, if you had not done that yet, you can still apply. Great. Where we are. Okay, great. Any questions in the queue? I'm not sure any callers in the question queue at this time. Once again, if you'd like to ask a question verbally, dial pound two on your telephone keypad. Again, that's pound two if you'd like to ask a question. All right, I'm not showing any callers in queue at this time. Okay. Um, well, thank you for checking. I, we might have just bought ourselves just enough time for my, me to reconnect to the Internet. The uh, Internet just went out, but I think it's back on again. So uh, I, think, I think I can uh, continue presenting and, and do this little plan tour of the website here. Um, so let me see if I can move to share my screen. Give me just a moment. Sorry about that. Okay, great. I think this is working. Um, what I wanted to do was just show you guys where a couple of the resources are that we've referenced um, and on the ONAP Quote Talk website. So you should see our front page of the website now. 
where everything is housed related to the COVID Republic recovery program is here on this uh, COVID-19 recovery program link. You'll notice, you know, when you first open up the website, there are a bunch of kind of recent updates posted. Um, so you can kind of jump right into that uh, if you'd like, or you can go to this link and, and find where everything, um, take a look at everything. Um, Gary did mention earlier that there are slides on reporting uh, on FAFADA and other kind of generally applicable reporting requirements. You'll notice those are actually right here on the front page because uh, it was a fairly recent training. So just in case you're especially interested in that based on today's discussion, um, those slides are right there on the front page. I am the recorder. Okay, so if you go into the COVID recovery programs page, you'll see we've separated out between CARES Act and ARP. As we get further along in the processes for ARP and materials that we had for CARES, you know, could still apply or we are still using them for ARP, we will make sure to also post them to the ARP page. Uh, so hopefully this helps kind of keep everything um, maybe a little bit less confusing uh, as, you're, as you're taking a look at program materials. When you go on the ARP page, you'll see that uh, a lot of the uh, information that we've discussed today is posted there. So the implementation notice, of course, is the most recently published information. The allocations, there were some questions about allocations, or I guess related to allocations. Uh, one person asked how much they can apply for. Uh, that would be your allocation, and you can find that here. Um, we have a link to the Act itself. Um, we have a link to um, the IHPAPR form and the instructions for opening the form. Uh, so hopefully it's helpful to know that those things are there and to know where they are. Once again, just want to really encourage you to familiarize yourself with the, the implementation notice and those requirements uh, and then just dive right into submitting your abbreviated IHP. Okay. Oh, and of course, um, this is also where the slides from this training and the recording of this training will be posted. That's good to mention. Okay. I think that's about it, it for our presentation. Um, as we've mentioned several times, you know, as you get into the details of what you're considering doing with your IHP, IHP please, please, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble talking apparently. Please make sure uh, to feel free to reach out to your area ONAP staff. Um, we've been through uh, a lot of these questions before with the CARES Act funding. Um, and we also have a pretty good system worked out for being responsive to questions that may be new, um, either to, to all of ONAP or to the person that you're working with. So we really encourage you to work with them um, in, in uh, considering what you would like to do. Any other questions on, on the phone or in the chat? Once again, if you'd like to ask your question verbally, dial pound two on your telephone keypad. You can also ask your questions using the chat function. Just remember to select all panelists from the drop-down menu before submitting your question. All right, I'm not showing any uh, verbal questions at this time. Okay, great. Um, and we, we continue to get lots of questions about when the training will be available. Uh, please make sure to keep an eye on the ONAP Code Talk. That's where we will post it. We should be able to get the slides right up. In fact, um, we might they might already be posted. I might have just seen that. Um, it, but if they're not already posted, they could be up. They will be up there very soon. The recording will take a bit longer, uh, but we will post that too. Um, and then there's an additional question, which has come up before, but before we go, just want to make sure to address it. 
about the deadline to submit the abbreviated, I abbreviated IHP. There is no deadline, but we do encourage you to submit them soon, you know, due to the nature of the funding to be being in response to a pandemic, an emergency type of situation. We just want to make sure you get a hold of those funds uh, as quickly as possible so that you can use them for that purpose. Um, okay. Well, thank you all so much for attending. Thank you so much for all of the good questions. Uh, a huge thank you to uh, Gary, to Sean, and to Rebecca for helping with the presentation and with the questions. A huge thank you to Iris for helping us put all of this together. And a big thanks to Tegan, our facilitator. Thank you. Um, I hope this was helpful. And um, keep an eye on CoTalk for, for follow-ups such as these materials, this recording, and, uh, and all the other things that are to come. Uh, to help with implementation uh, of this funding. Y'all take care. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.